My name's Theo Kane Garvey. I'm an independent filmmaker, an illustrator, retro enthusiast and journalist born and raised in the steel city of Sheffield. I'm also known to some as battle rapper, psychosis holocaust, but no matter what I'm doing, it's all connected to the fact that I love making art, watching movies and being creative. On top of all this, along with my team, the Chef Spendables, we've spent the last few years painstakingly putting together the most ambitious project that we've ever attempted. My feature-length post-apocalyptic action adventure movie, Unit 11. So you could say that we're quite busy, but I couldn't turn down the opportunity to create our own TV show, so me and the team are pulling together all of our resources to let you into our world and speak to other people that are on similar missions to what we are, as well as throwing a ton of other cool stuff just for the fun of it. Because there's so much more out there than what the modern day mainstream media spoon feeds us, not to mention all the amazing old school nostalgia that we forget about, so we're going to take you on a journey deep underground. This is Slimehouse TV. Thank you. Welcome to Slimehouse TV, the show that brings you the very best in underground movies, cult music, and anything else cool, artistic, retro, and edgy. We're a completely self-funded show. The budget for this program is at zero, but what we lack in funding, we make up for with a sick lineup of special guests that we're going to feature throughout this series. Now, as far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a filmmaker. And as soon as I was old enough to venture out on my own, I did everything I could to try and hook up with existing companies to do some work for. With no proper experience or professional qualifications, this proved quite difficult. However, my next guest is one of the few people that took me seriously, and at just 17, I'd been working with him for companies as big as Sky TV. He's just finished filming a feature-length documentary, shot on location in South Africa, called Great White Short Legend. But in my opinion, he's a legend. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for one of the first people to ever take me seriously as a filmmaker, Ricardo Lacombe. Wicked, so we've got Ricardo Lacombe, and what I want to ask you first of all is just for anyone that doesn't know, can you just give me a bit about your background, like how we met and stuff, and, and what, what got you into filmmaking? Yeah, yeah man, uh, we started making, I was working with a couple of guys, and we started filmmaking in about uh, 2007, 2006, 2007. Uh, we, we, we pitched an idea to some friends to just shoot like a home video project, uh, and it was like a spoof documentary about a guy who was on TV with a poker. And we, um, we wrote to the company who made the film for ch uh, the program for Channel 5, asking him if we could maybe just use the rights to use a little bit of the footage off the TV show because we were going to sell some DVDs online. And, and amazingly, they came back and said, we'd like, a, we'd like a broadcast option on this. We'd like to see about broadcasting it. And we were like, come on, we just shot this on camcorders with his mates and stuff. And it took us very seriously. And so we started up in his game, uh, buying some HD gear, started actually you know, putting some thought into films and thinking we might be onto something here, we can do this. And in the process of that, we started hooking up with people around Sheffield, uh, like the uh, like the deranged pictures guy and people like that. And then your name came up time and time again. We were doing something that needed some horror special effects makeup, and your name just kept coming up all the time. You've got to work with this guy Theo. You've got to work with this guy Theo. And then, you know, this punk kid walks through the door with his bag of makeup and everything, and just absolutely just blew us away. You blew us away with the makeup effects that you were doing. And I just remember after that, we just started talking outside of like horror and makeup and doing into like documentaries and then coming on board as like, because you were skilled as like editing and uh, skilled as a cameraman. And it was like, here's a guy who's just doing everything. Wicked man, so that's enough about me, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but no, just, and, and obviously, that's obviously me and you met through uh, independent filmmaking and stuff. And then since then, I've gone off and gone on, with, I've gone off and got on with my thing, you're, you're doing your thing now. So this, yeah. this film, Great White Short Legend, like, where, where did that idea come from? Well, because I've been working in, like, sort of corporate video, and, and that's basically where I was earning money, I was earning it on corporate video. I was working for, like, Apple, we did a British Airways job, you know, real big stuff, as well as, like, your local restaurants and stuff like that. I went out to South Africa, me and my wife, uh, doing great white shark cage diving in South Africa and just mesmerised by the whole thing. But I'd shot video while I was out there and I said to the tour company, you can kind of use this if you want, here's some stuff I shot. They came back and said, can we, can we work with you? Would you do some promos for us? We commission you for some adverts and promos. So like, this is a no brainer. I'm going to get paid and it's something I love doing. So they sent me a whole box of tapes, all this footage I got and we started just making adverts for them. And over about 18 months, two years working for them, they started 
they were sort of like itching to do a little bit more. We were wanting to do something a little bit bigger. And you know, like on you turn like Discovery Channel or BBC, and you see all this great white shark stuff, and it's all like teeth mm. and blood and attacking seals and all that sort of stuff. We knew that was all absolute bull. That's not how great white sharks are when you're actually this close to them, up close and personal. So we pitched this idea about can we make a documentary that captures how they actually are when you're in the water, in a cage, next to a great white shark, and it's nothing like you were told it was on TV. Wicked, well, I've seen the film, it's wicked. I've got a little clip to show you, so we'll, uh, we'll have a little cool. look at the video, man, and everyone else can see it, because I love it, you know what I mean? So Thanks, we, can, we can check it out. You always see a white shark in the front of the paper, and it's always mouth open teeth. That's how a white shark is portrayed in the media. It's a killer, it's a mindless killer. It's always guts, it's always teeth, it's always front page of the headlines. The media will, in the end, kill a white shark, or is killing the white shark, should I say. Most people only have the knowledge that comes through, you know, reading the newspapers, and then that's normally about shark attacks and all the negative things that happen about it. It's all fine and very well seeing it on TV or Jaws, etc. Mm -hmm. and you get a very false misinterpretation sometimes from what these sharks really are. But this is actually a very calm creature. Yes, it attacks and it hunts when it needs to. Yet shark will generally not attack a human, and we've seen this time and time again, and this is one thing that we've seen here in Cape Town. A lot of the surfers realise that we're not part of their future. I think fear is healthy. I think that what we need to get over is those knee-jerk reactions to dealing with that fear. A lot of people uh, are scared of white sharks, but you can't live your life in fear, you know. You've got to go out there, enjoy it, and face it. It's a magical place. And when I go out there, I, I always realize how old this place is too. It's been there for millions of years. And this interaction that's happening between the sharks and the seals has happened there for countless years before us. Everything that you learned about white sharks, what I'd read in books, what I'd seen on the TV, what I'd heard people say, I just realized how much they didn't know. So when I was like watching some of your other interviews and stuff, you told me that like you made this off the back of having a fear of great white sharks. I, I just want to know like how, how does someone that's never going to come into contact with a shark have the fear for him? Because that's like me saying I've got a fear of octopuses, but one's never going to come in my house. Yeah. Well, it can come in my house. I, I don't mind octopuses, but I'm saying like <laughs> as it, you're never going to come into contact with one unless you go in a boat with one, which is what you did. So tell me like a bit about that. That's my next film, man. Great White Octopus Legend. You've just spoiled that one for me now. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I swear Shark to Puss is an actual Charles Band thing or Roger Corman production straight to video Sky thing anyway. So carry on. <laughs> so yeah, man. Tell so a bit about that. yeah, all it was is when, because we'd gone out there on holiday originally just to go and dive with sharks, it was a total fear. I was absolutely petrified. Not maybe so much of sharks, but being out on this tiny little boat in the middle of the ocean. And that comes from like, I mean, when I was young, one of the first films I ever remember seeing back in Canada was Jaws. You know, I'm sat in the, I'm sat in the driving theatre as a little kid watching Jaws, and, and I remember this idea of this tiny little bow out on this ocean, and there's a freaking shark in the water. You know, that was the thing. That's what I'd been grown up led to believe, that you've got to be terrified of these things in the water. So get yourself out on a boat, and you're going out there at like 6.30 in the morning, and you know you're going out, and you know there's sharks in the water. And you're in this boat, and you know that at any time, there's like 40, 50 great whites in this bay around you. Uh, and uh, since then, and I, I, I kid you not, I wouldn't even step in a stream or a river without fearing that something's past my foot. You know, you don't know what it is. Come a shark. Someone once told me there was a shark in the River Don, and I believed them. And I grew up with that I kind wish. of... wish! <laughs> shark and an alligator was what someone told me, and I believed it. Tell me about the most thrilling experience you had when you were out with these sharks. How close did you actually get to the, to the Great White? The, the, the most thrilling experience was also one of the most stupid experiences, because when I first was getting out of the cage, and my fat ass is sat on the side of a, of a cage in a wetsuit with all these weight belts around you. And, and I got out wrong and I got my back to the open water. So cameras and that are all off, but I'm, I'm, I'm falling backwards because the weight belt is taking me back out the, to the open water. And thankfully, this one guy on the boat, Wellington, he reached forward. I saw him through my goggles. He reached forward and grabbed my belt and he just held me there until I could get a grip and get back on the boat. Of course, sort of laughing at me at that point. But when I got on, he said, turn around. And we looked back around and right behind me, there's a shark coming straight for the boat. And it's like, I probably would have been all right, but I was that close to my head in the back of the water with a five metre, one ton, great white shark. 
And like, obviously that was something that could have seriously messed up production. <laughs> uh, <laughs> did anything else happen? Like, how smoothly did production run on a boat with loads of GoPros and cameras with a smooth production or did you have your cups? Well, first day there, as we were I'm sat in Heathrow Airport and one of the main guys that we needed to interview was this surfer uh, who also worked on cage diving boats. And while I'm ready to fly out, he sends me a message saying he's got a job somewhere in the Maldives, he's got to go. So it's like, you can't go, I need you for this film. You know, we've just spent thousands of pounds getting to this point. We got it that when we landed, we had half an hour once we got to our apartment, unpacked the bags, we had to go straight away and do a, a, a full interview with him. And after the interview, he said, do you want to come and film us going surfing? And we strapped his surfboard with all these GoPro cameras that they'd lent us. And he goes out and there's not even any surf. It was just nothing, bit of kelp, there's no sharks, there's nothing. And he just stops and he, he picks his surfboard up after about five minutes, points to the board and all the GoPro cameras have fell off him. All the mounts on the cameras had come off. Day one, totally knackered, we'd just lost most of our best gear. What I always like to ask filmmakers is like, when you, because be, obviously, one well, myself, I know that when you've put all organisation into something, all your time and stuff, and then stuff starts messing up, or for whatever reason, people can't be there, things go wrong. I always like to ask filmmakers, like, how would you persevere through them times when you've had this vision and it might not exactly be going how you want it and stuff? Like, what do you do to get through that? That's a good question, man, because obviously I've been, on, I've been on set with you, I've been on your films, and I've seen when you've got all these explosions and guns and stuff going on, and like, a lot can go wrong. I think for myself, you've you've just got to you've just got to crack on. You've just got to do whatever you need to do to get on. The thing is about filmmaking, what a lot of people might not realise, it ain't glamorous. You know, you say, "Oh, I'm a filmmaker. I do camera, I do editing, whatever." None of it is glamorous. It's it's awesome. It's the best thing to do in the world. But there's no glitz and glamour about it. So when you're in the absolute crap and you're covered in mud or you're losing your cameras or people aren't showing up or whatever, you've just got to persevere. Without going into it too much, you, you didn't have the best start in life. It were a pretty grim background, you know what I mean? Like yeah. parental issues and that kind of thing. Just for anyone else that's not had the best start in life, what kind of advice would you give them if they've got a dream that they want to pursue and they've got the start that's like, no, you're not doing nothing with yourself? Yeah, well, this, this, this is how I've led my life is, you know, I mean, I, I probably had a worse start to my life and childhood than probably most people in this room. And I, I've put that, I mean, I, I spent years, and again, I'm not going to sink anybody's boat and go into the, the nitty gritty of it, but, you know, spending years of sort of like abuse. I was an alcoholic by the time I was like 13. You know, I was on a bottle of whiskey at night by the time I'm 16. You know, it, it was hard stuff. And there was a point in there where I realised there's only one person who's in control of what you're doing in your life, and that is you. I got smacked around and, and caught and beat as a kid. That doesn't mean that I have to go on and do that. So when I'm again, you know, I'm, a, I'm living in Stocksbridge, you know, I've got a young, I've got a new family, bringing up a family, and I find myself out on a shark boat with a load of nice pricey gear, and somebody's paying you to go out and make a really nice film, something you've always wanted to do. That could have gone a hell of a lot different from, you know, from a start in life. Wicked, man. Well, you'd never know from knowing you, do you know what I mean? Like, about, about this kind of background, like I'd say... As soon as I met you, you've been nothing but helpful to me. You taught me so much to do with filmmaking. Um, and obviously now you're off in South Africa filming with sharks and stuff. So I mean, nothing's hold you back. Just finally, mate, what's next? What can we look forward to? See, this is the thing. Uh, if I told you that, you know, I've done all this thing documentary again, and you're doing a shark film and it's awesome with sharks. If I told like, you... What's next? Dinosaurs? Or... <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm expecting what next. Me, if yeah. only, what if I told you it was childbirth from a dad's perspective? Really? Okay, well, normally that's not my thing, but if you made it, I'll check it out, because I know... <laughs> I know that it won't be just <laughs> what you say, it'll, there'll be some crazy it, twist on it and it'll be wicked. It's, it's kind of tied in with a, with a couple of local charities and a few people I've been talking to. Wicked, man. Well, I can't wait for whatever's coming out next. Ricardo, you've been a don. Give him a round of applause, people. <laughs> Time again, Slimehouse video reviews. Uh, again, myself, Tasman, massive film fans. We're just going to give you a, a bit about some of our favourite films each week. We look at something retro. Could be 60s, 70s, 80s, even 90s in some cases. What we got this week, Tasman? All right, so this week we're looking at The Blob. I used to watch this with my dad when I was a kid, um, so it's got a lot of fond memories for me. I'm in a hurry. We're going to go bowling with Anthony. And then to the movies. 
No, absolutely not. It's a story about us sending something up into space which, when it comes back down, sort of mutates and becomes like a, a flesh eating bacteria type blob which causes mayhem and, and havoc and kills everything and it sort of de develops a taste for human flesh. What is this? That thing on his hand. Brian and Meg, like the heroes of the story, are trying to save their town. It's um, a proper small town movie. Proper isn't it? little small town movie, um, but it's so like really beautifully shot, and the effects are amazing. <laughs> This film had a 19 million budget and 9 million of that was all put into effects and it really shows you get your 80s horror films that are quite ropey and you can see where the effects are not always that good and that's kind of the charm but you can't really put the blob in that category because the effects are probably some of the most underrated effects in any 80s movie ever and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about this film. <laughs> Some of the death sequences in it are unbelievable. My favourite has got to be the phone box scene where the, the blob sort of encompasses the poor person stuck inside the phone box and you can see the decomposing bodies against the edges of the glass. Give me her! Give her! Kill her! He went down to the diner. And it basically just... Just, just pops the glass. Just pops the glass. <laughs> one of the best death sequences in the film, even though they're all good. There's not all one that's like forgettable in any way at all. <laughs> the director, Chuck Russell, uh, he also made one of my favorite Nightmare on Elm Streets, which is Dream Warriors part three. And then he went off to make stuff like The Mask uh, later on. And it's also co-written by Frank Darabont, who, went off to become like a certified guy in Hollywood. He made, he directed the Shawshank Redemption, he directed Green Mile, so he's a, a certified guy. He made The Mist and then also the first episodes of Walking Dead and stuff. So this this was co-written by someone that now is like a, a Hollywood veteran. <laughs> The deaths in this are slightly different to some of the films of that era in that they're not like slasher type deaths so there isn't another another person like slashing with knives and blood this is this is about like couples in a car kissing and the face just caves in from the mm. inside <laughs> It's a proper monster movie, it's a creature feature, but because of the deaths being so visceral and melty, it's also all part of that 80s gross out thing. <laughs> it's also an era when films like the late 80s, early 90s, where we were, we were getting remakes, because this is a remake, this is a remake of the, the classic Steve McQueen 1958 version of The Blob, and around that time we had films like John Carpenter's The Thing, which was obviously a remake, Night of the Living Dead, and all those kind of films that were getting remade, in a time when remaking a film was something to look forward to. The Blob, 1988. Chuck Russell, another one of our favourites, and if you're not too familiar with the 80s gore fest kind of stuff, the 80s gross out, then it's something that you definitely want to check out. That's 1988, Chuck Russell, The Blob. Do you all listen to me? Listen to this. Sticking with the theme of independent filmmaking, after the break we've got a 20 minute special on YouTube Titan and claymation animator Liard Castle. But from us here in the studio, that's all for tonight. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time on Slimehouse TV. <laughs>
My name is Yayan Parry, this is uh, my tattoo studio, Bully Inc. I moved to Sheffield when I was 16, I'm originally from North Wales. I've always been passionate about tattooing. I couldn't say that when I was a kid I wanted to grow up and be a tattooist because I didn't even know what a tattoo was. But when I first discovered tattooing, all I saw it as was like drawing on people. And at that point I was fascinated by it. I used to stay inside at school while all my mates went outside and played football or, I don't know, tally or hide and seek and shit like that. But I was always the one that had to stay inside. Um, kind of like a bit of a social reclusion, you know, I kept myself to myself. Um, I met Theo when I was in college studying graphic design. I've known him, I'd say, easily about 10 years now. Um, just started to hang out a bit and then I found that he was influenced and like really interested in filming. He asked me to come along and help him on once. So it was it was something different to do and obviously from that I got into that, really enjoyed it. Uh, even now when we're working on this film Unit 11, it's a multiple thing. I can do anything from helping out with a bit of makeup, like running through lines with people, like shooting some of the footage, recording with the sound, uh, acting, taking care of some of the pyrotechnics, anything really, even if it's just a case of picking people up uh, from the other side of the city and bringing them back or bringing them to like location. I mean, we've driven to London before just to get a short it probably adds up to 10 seconds of the film and we've, both, we've, like, we've all give up time and put a lot of effort into making it, filming it, being on locations, all stuff like that. The biggest thing I'm looking forward to is everyone that's been involved in it in any way, like big or small, to all be sat down and to see what they've actually achieved by doing it all together. Um, because you couldn't, you couldn't just do it on your own, there's no physical way you could do it on your own. What we've what you're actually creating or created. Um, there's no way you can do that on your own and it's all the help and support that we've had from each other that's getting it to what it is. People go out and, like, and they get pissed every weekend because that's what they need to do to make their life interesting or entertaining. Do you know, they need to go out and get absolutely hammered and spend the wages that they've worked all week to get and wake up on a Sunday morning feeling like shit. But on a Sunday morning, I'd rather go out with my mates and be filming Unit 11 and putting something into that, as much effort into that as these like drunk morons, these idiots, these lost souls doing to drinking, you know, at least we'll all have something to show for it at the end of it and we'll all be proud of it instead of being proud of a hangover and some random bird laid next to you in a bed and a lighter wallet. I'd say all of like, the lot of us really were like Chef Spendables, it's technically like a big family, you know, it's all different walks of life, different pasts, you know, we, we're we always doing it as a team, there's never like, you're never really struggling too much, if you need a bit of help, you just ask and one of us, if not all of us, will come along to like help you out in any way that we can, and if we can't, we'll try and formulate some way of getting around it, you know, you're never really, you're never really left on your own with that, so, so it, it's good to have that, that type of family, that bond with your mates, because you don't you don't get that anymore, you know. People are always out backstabbing and stuff like that, but it doesn't happen with this. I couldn't ask for anything different, you know. I, I do I do love them and I respect them, and I would do anything for them, and I'm pretty sure they'd do the same for me. Slimehouse TV, Phil King over there, on the road again. This time we're just heading up to Harrogate, just outside Leeds, to interview and hopefully check out the studio of uh, none other than Lee Hardcastle. If you don't know about Lee Hardcastle, he's basically one of the biggest claymation animators in the world now. Nah, his videos get millions of views online, he gets ridiculous hits on his stuff, it goes viral and he's currently working for Adult Swim, E4 and various other big name companies and bands and stuff. I met him at a film festival in Sheffield, Celluloid Screams, where he was screening his uh, short film Ghost Burger. <laughs> So it's going to be good to find out what he's working on now and if he's got anything bigger coming out in the future. He's expecting us, hopefully, so that'll be cool. Lee, how are we doing, mate? All right, yeah, not bad. Good to see you, man. Good to see you. Are we coming right. in? Yeah. <gasps> Yeah, so here we are in the uh, that home of Liard Castle. Um, instantly, I'm seeing a table with loads of clay. Do you want to just talk me through what you've got going on here? Well, this is where I do all my sculpting. Yeah, I mean, I use plasticine to make my models out of. It's a cheap material. 
don't really cost a lot of money. Um, and I sculpt that around these things which are called armatures. And armatures are just like metal skeletons, kind of like the Terminator. Mm. Sometimes I make my own, I literally just use this wire. When you're ordering these, is there, because obviously I'm seeing this one's got three fingers and stuff, is that like a specific style of armature, a bit more like of a cartoony version? Not no, I mean that's just my little uh, person by a um, modification that I've done All to right. the model, like that's just a bit of oven baking clay on there. Wicked man, how much are they cost? They're expensive. Uh, they are very expensive, they're about mm. eight. To I think like 100 pounds each? I can't yeah. remember, it was a long time ago. For a hot tape price. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I reckon next stage is to have a look where the magic happens. Yeah, because I, I do all that separately. I do that in the studio. Cool, so I'm gonna... Do you want to know where... Yeah, I'd like to see you, the studio. Do you want to know where cool. the studio is? Yeah, yeah, where's that? Well, it's just above your head. Alright, we can <laughs> cool. Well, Cool, so we're, uh, here we are in studio. Tell me for what you're working on, man. Well, Looks interesting. at the minute, I'm doing a parody of John Carpenter's thing with Disney's Frozen. She's, well, it's not Elsa, it's one of those things. If I'm not wrong, you've, you've done something thing related before, haven't you? I have. Took twice. Well, it's, it's, not, it's not that it's going to be a running thing, but we did Pingu's the thing, which did me a lot of favours yeah. and a lot of trouble. So then I remade that with cats, but the problem was it didn't sort of spark the same imagination mm. as Pingu did, so I'm kind of going back on the controversial road again yeah. and doing something that I'm sure people are going to enjoy. So these are the, these are the guns you use for the uh, action sequences. I'm spotting a lot of like action man. 80s, 70s and 60s weapons. Oh, I've just knocked over loads of eyes. Don't worry about it. Is that what they are, eyes? Yeah. So when I like with a little clip, that's off Action Man, French Resistance Fighter. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> a scene in Ghost Burger where they go into a gun shop and there's loads of guns all over the mm. world. So like... It's that commando scene. I like the stuff that's more detailed, like this guy's pump action shotgun. Wicked. Party's over. <laughs> Party's over. We get to have a sit down and I can ask you a few questions. Yeah, just first of all, I wanted to just ask you a little, it's quite a generic question, but just for people that might not be as aware of you as I am, and like where you, where you started, how you got into filmmaking, and what brought you into the animation side of things. Well, I always wanted to be a filmmaker. Should I'll I take you take it, yeah, that's fine. I always wanted to be a filmmaker. I always wanted to be like Sam Raimi, Steven Spielberg, Quentin Tarantino, them kind of guys. I always wanted to do live action films. I never intended to do animation. I went to film school when I was 18, um, quickly discovered like the perils and the difficulties involved to filmmaking. And my problem was I always wanted to do stuff like John Carpenter's The Thing and then kind of uh, Evil Dead 2, the stuff that requires a lot of camera trickery and a lot of uh, big special effects and practical effects and that kind of thing. And that's very difficult to do in live action, but when it comes to... Um, stop motion animation which I experimented with during film school I was like all of a sudden exposed to the possibilities of doing these kind of uh, techniques and tricks and stuff that you do on camera but within stop motion animation for a little money you are crazy was you putting stuff on YouTube and it going viral was that always the plan was that like kind of like your little plan to, to do or is that something that just happened without you really realizing it I always made content before YouTube and I always used to have to show it to people by using VHS tapes and DVDs and share it that way. So then when YouTube came around, well, before YouTube I was using Google Video or something and um, so I was able to put my videos online and just send the link to people and that to me was just like 
something really new and exciting. And then along with that, along with YouTube and stuff like that, you got people whose videos went viral. And, um, you know, I always fancied achieving something like that. Um, but I never sort of like set out to do that per se. I just wanted to make videos like regardless and um, just hope that people enjoyed them. The first video that went viral was a video called The Evil Dead Done in Six Seconds, which was done for a competition for the Empire Magazine's uh, Done in Six Seconds contest where they had to remake a film of your choice and retell it in 60 seconds. Um, that video, just it, it was the first time that I experienced a video where people really liked it and people got excited about it and people were like, oh my God, this is amazing. I've never experienced that before. And um, yeah, that, that was my first sort of success. Didn't Sam Raimi see that? Yeah, he did. He did. I got an email off a guy called Aaron Lamb. And funny enough, he's producing the Evil Dead series. That's the now making it at the okay, minute. Yeah, yeah. But this was like back in the day, like in 2010. And he sent me an email saying, Hi, I'm Sam Raimi's assistant. Just letting you know that um, Sam and the guys, like Rob Tapper, we've all seen the Dunning Six Second video and we really enjoy it and all that kind of business. And I was like, Wow, this is cool. Yeah. And John Carpenter as well. Yep. Similar thing. Yeah, similar story with JC. That's sorry, my boy. With Pingu as a thing, um, again, people really uh, captured people's imaginations, and 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 John Carpenter over Twitter uh, responded and said, you know, um, I think he just, I think he said, is it better than the original or awesome? something? It's funny, I don't know, but it, it was good to get a little response oh, out of him. Yeah, I'm gonna do that. <laughs> I seen something that, that you did before where you were, were like a video about your life and you were t and you've like you've lived all over, you've worked from all over and just tell me a bit about like what it's like doing what you do and having to no matter where you was in the world, still having to churn out this content and getting on with it. I kind of entrepreneurially took it upon myself to dedicate a career to making videos on YouTube. Um, reasons being that I saw potential in it, so that people were getting excited about it. Uh, I mean, I always wanted to make, I always wanted to make feature films, but I knew that it was kind of a, a bit of a wasted avenue to pursue. And I knew that this was working for me. So I decided to just work like uh, all day, every day, like a normal job, treat it like a normal job. And I didn't necessarily have my own studios to work in and stuff like that. So I had to sort of make do with uh, with whatever I had, like a table, just set up a table and point the camera. And, and, and really, like I'm saying, make do, but that's all you need when it came to doing what I was doing anyway. We talked a bit about it um, already, but when you've been doing these videos, like the kind of like well-known filmmakers and people in that drama like that have expressed an interest in, in what you've been doing and like are essentially a fan of you now like can you just like tell me a few of them people that you've met because it seems like you've met quite a few and and got some props from some pretty big names yeah definitely i've uh, been acquainted with a bunch of people uh loads of directors there's too many to name i'm not showing off or anything and <laughs> um and and without name dropping too much, neither. Oh, um, away, that's the question. Oh gosh, I mean, um, my my most recent acquired fan is Eli Roth. Funny enough, oh, wait, he's been like wicked, wicked. he's been he's been in touch. Um, guys like Edgar Wright, um, Gareth Evans, who directed the Raid. Well, I had to do I I was hired to make a fan video, like a promotional video for the Raid, and he saw that film and he was like really blown away by it. So, funny enough, he put a clay cat cameo in the raid two. It like appears as a piece of graffiti, like just before the car chase yeah. sequence. It's funny that I'm more appreciated by legitimate filmmakers from like genre mm. film festivals and that kind of thing, rather than the animation community. Like people like Adman couldn't give two shits about me. Mm. It's the whole sort of independent spirit of like filmmaking and, and, and the fact that it is from a genre. And I don't think it's appreciated so much in the animation community because um, it's too low budget. Like they go for like a creme de la creme when it comes to animation. Like everything's got to be perfect and and uh, just, you know, it's got to have a soul and a life. But what I do is it's something completely different. It's, it's crude, yet it has a voice mm. and it just sort of like, you know, expresses 
much like a cinematic film. I, I, I'd describe it kind of like organised chaos. Like even though your stuff's crude and rough around the edges, that's kind of the charm of it. I think that's what draws people. That's uh, what drew me when I first ever saw Tears for Toilet. It's, I know obviously you're doing it in a, in a little loft in one little corner, but like the camera angles that you're getting, they're like big budget Hollywood kind of camera angles. The action when you're doing stuff like the um, the drug bus one, it looks like Leon from our, from Resident <laughs> Evil, like that kind of stuff, like the kind of action shooting through the fan, like it's majorly cinematic. Like, how, how do you achieve that kind of thing? Is that just from watching films and just picking it up? So I like to um, really examine a, a scene or some footage from a, from a movie. It's quite amazing to see like how one shot is uh, two, uh, two seconds long and then the following one's like literally 10 frames. Yeah. I always find that fascinating. I always sort of imitate that kind of thing, and that's like my, that's like my own personal film school. Yo, back up is here. <gasps> Very monotonous. Is that the word? monotonous so tedious yeah i'm a rapper i should know about these <laughs> words uh, but yeah no he's quite like sat on your own in these dark rooms for so long when i read like ray Ariausen's book and stuff he said that he'd spend like six months in a room on his own in darkness it's like i did used to sort of lock myself away for like i remember i did when i did ghost burger that was like a four month project to shoot in for like i remember like two of them months i didn't see anybody i was just constantly working and i just remember the way I was when I went outside the house and went to the supermarket, I was sort of deteriorating and getting really jittery around people. And, and, and what I've discovered is that you lose your rhythm like of, of being able to communicate with people and stuff like that. It's a, it's a weird thing. I mean, but saying all that, I'm, I'm, I'm quite a solitary dude. Like, um, I'm, I'm quite happy to be alone. I'm quite happy to work into a closet. And then, the joy of it is that I bring whatever it is I've been working on out to uh, to the world and, and, and then engage in conversation about it and get the response out of it. So in a way, I guess I am talking to people, but just like, you know, presenting it all in one little batch of work that you just think watching like a minute. <laughs> So obviously when I first met you, you just released Ghost Burger and that were the one that you premiered at Celluloid Screams. And off the back of that, is that I mean, obviously you, you, were, you were getting this um, this spook train off, off the ground. Please keep arms and legs inside the train at all times. Otherwise you'll be as dead as this guy. <laughs> I know, like you said before about making a feature film, but like effectively, are you eventually going to work towards that feature film? And I saw your live action film that you did. So, is it are you wanting to incorporate more live action stuff into what you're doing in the future? I think I'm going to attempt both. I mean, I'm definitely going to do. I'm definitely going to do Spook Train at some point. I need to get that on my system. But the problem with that is, it's it's a, it's a two year project. I need to find um, time and, and and a way to commit to something like that. I mean, I'm not going to be creating videos for YouTube for the rest of my life like it's not it's not really viable I need to sort of grow and I and personally I want to I want to uh, achieve certain stuff before I pass away not you never know if you're going to die tomorrow so carpe diem live for today so I want to sort of uh, come up with a with a script or a or a project that I could do viably in live action um, and I've got like a couple of ideas that I'm playing around with at the minute that would mean that. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to push myself and, and try and attempt something like that sooner rather than later, uh, regardless of uh, financial and uh, of personal situations. You've been an absolute legend, mate. Thank you very much for letting us come down to Harrogate and check out your studio. I'm a massive fan and I can't wait to see what you come out with in the future. You're welcome. Nice one, pal.